You're listening to an Ono Media podcast. Good morning, and thanks for joining me for Rise and Crime, your morning caffeine hit all about crime. I'm Mama Jules, and let's get you all caught up on what one former district attorney out of Denver calls, quote, one of the most prolific serial rapists in the history of the state of Colorado. Now, that convicted rapist, 37-year-old Stephen Matthews, well, he's been sentenced. And like all cases, when the word serial is involved, it's pretty certain the abuse will span years. And that's exactly what Dr. Matthews' rapes did. They spanned from 2019 to 2023. But it took just one brave woman to come forward in March of 2023, telling her story about how Dr. Matthews asked her on a date then drugged her, and then assaulted her. One month later, nine more women came forward saying, hey, he did exactly the same thing to me. Then three months after that, three more women came forward. It was now a dozen women accusing Dr. Matthews of sexual assault. And boy, did this guy have an MO. Typically, he would ask the women on a date, And then as the date was coming to a close, he would say that he needed to maybe walk his dog at his home really quick before taking the date back to their house. Once they stopped at his house, he would say he needed to grab something inside the home and he would invite the date inside. That's when the date would take a dark turn. His behavior, once inside, would become very pushy, insisting that he needed to make a drink for them and not relenting when he would ask them to, hey, just stay for a minute, play a board game with me, or just chat. Now, if he had drugged the date with her drink, he knew it wouldn't take long for the drug to take effect. Sometimes he would just ask them to stay for maybe five to 10 minutes, knowing that drug would have the desired effect that quickly. Now, most of the women were completely unaware of the sexual assault. But they were aware of this. When they woke up, they would often find themselves naked and unsure of their surroundings. One woman testified that when she awoke in Dr. Matthew's home, she was naked and handcuffed to the sofa. She began vomiting from the drugs. Now, for the 11 women who eventually testified in the Dr. Matthew's trial, it really was a grueling process filled with stern cross-examinations by the defense attorneys. One of the 11 women said... She had sent a text to Dr. Matthews. This was after the sexual assault. And in that text, she said she thought she had been drugged, but that she wasn't sure he was the one who did the drugging. In that text, she then went on to apologize for her drinking, and she admitted how embarrassed she was. Well, defense attorney seized on those texts, suggesting in the cross-examination that she was perpetrating her own ruse on Dr. Matthews. And through that ruse, she was just trying to bait him into admitting he was involved. They said she did all of it because of her ashamed feelings. Well, the first woman to file assault charges, she took the stand and she told of how Dr. Matthews took her on a date and they eventually ended up in a hot tub with a drink prepared by Dr. Matthews. Sounds familiar, right? And she only remembers this part, that she lost consciousness, and then several hours later, she awoke in her own home with no knowledge of how she had gotten there. At first, she didn't speak up, but after sharing her story with a close friend, that friend said, you need to talk with my mom. The friend's mother said she was aware of Dr. Matthews and that this wasn't the first time that he had been accused privately of sexual assault. She then knew she needed to go to authorities. Well, collectively, all of those brave women were able to testify. And after three days of deliberation, the jury ultimately found the Denver cardiologist guilty of 35 counts of sexual assault and second degree assault charges. Only three counts were found to not be guilty. One victim who said she would like to be referred to as Audrey, well, she acknowledged after the guilty verdict that in reality, the verdict doesn't change anything. She said lifelong physical and emotional trauma are the result of what happened to her. Then another victim who chose not to be identified said that Dr. Matthews took away years from her life and also from the other victims' lives. She said her ability to live freely without being worried that she might be attacked again, 
Well, that's been completely taken away. When the guilty verdicts were handed down in August, Dr. Matthews appeared emotional while each verdict was read. He would shake his head, then cry openly. He would even place his head in his hands. One of the victims, Audrey, well, she said she felt the emotion was manufactured. She told reporters that she doesn't think he's sorry for what he did. She said he's just sorry because he got caught. Now, one victim wanted to commend the jury for taking their time and not rushing the verdict. She watched them take notes during the trial, and she appreciated their attention to the evidence. When Dr. Matthews was arrested back in March of 2023, and then again in April, and then again in October, he remained behind bars at the county jail, being held on a $5 million bond. Well, last week, Dr. Matthews was sentenced for his 35 guilty verdicts, and he will now spend 158 years in prison for drugging and sexually assaulting those women he met on dating apps like Hinge and Tinder. Judge Eric Johnson told Dr. Matthews that he had diminished this world with his actions, telling him that he hurts society as a whole and that the world is a darker place because of his crimes. Well, Dr. Matthews' lawyer has stated to CBS News that they will be appealing the convictions. And now to a lover's triangle, but we've got some twists here. 37-year-old Christine Banfield and 39-year-old Brendan Banfield, well, they're living well in Hendon, Virginia. That's an affluent neighborhood just outside of the Metro DC area. Brendan is working as a special agent with the IRS and Christine is a dedicated RN. The two had a four-year-old daughter and the couple decided they needed to get some help with their daughter and the juggling of their lives. So the two hired an au pair from Brazil. Enter stage left, Juliana Magalhães. And that 24-year-old, well, she moved in to Brendan and Christine's home. On February 24th of 2023, a 911 call was placed by the au pair at 7.49 a.m. from the Banfield residence. But she didn't say anything. She called 911 and then the phone line went dead. 13 minutes later, Juliana called 911 again, this time saying her friend was hurt. Then just moments later, Brendan grabbed the phone from Juliana and told the operator that he had shot a man who had entered his home and stabbed his wife. Well, when the police responded, they found Christine Banfield clinging to life, having suffered multiple stab wounds to her neck. Also dead in the home? 38-year-old Joseph Ryan, he'd been shot. Christine was naked and Joseph was fully clothed. So let's go back over that. We have the married couple, Brendan and Christine. The nanny calls 911, then she hangs up. She calls 13 minutes later and says her friend is hurt, not shot, not stabbed. She uses the word hurt. Then Brendan takes the phone and states that Joseph had entered the home and stabbed his wife, so he shot Joseph. Well, as investigators moved through the home, they found two guns and a knife that looked to be the weapon used in Christine's stabbing. And that stabbing, well, it's now turned into a murder because once Christine was transported to the hospital, she succumbed to her wounds. Well, this situation is a bit sketchy, but it's kind of believable, which is why detectives took it slow gathering evidence before eventually arresting Juliana eight months after the two deaths and charging her with second-degree murder. But detectives weren't finished yet. They were still building their case. Through their investigation, they had learned that the mysterious dude, Joseph, well, he didn't fit into this equation. And he had been lured to the home through a sexual fetish website. Investigators believe He was none the wiser. He really thought he was just showing up at the Banfields for a, quote, play date. Now, that sexual fetish website account that kind of snookered Joseph, well, it was a catfish account. Someone posing as Christine built the profile and through several conversations, scheduled the meetup at the Banfield home. But there was one thing the police could never figure out in the beginning. If Joseph had showed up to kill Christine, why did he simply park his car in the driveway of the home, like he's there to visit for breakfast or something? And then another issue. 
there was no forced entry. From day one, investigators said they knew that this was not a home invasion. So Joseph had clearly been invited into the home. Well, through their digging, they had solved the why part of Joseph being there. He was lured there for a sexual fantasy, and that's why his car was parked out front. But now they had to figure out who did the stabbing. Because remember, Brendan has already admitted to shooting Joseph. But who actually killed Christine? And what kind of shady antics are going on here? Well, guess what? We may never find out. Because since the arrest of Juliana, the nanny, Brendan has now been arrested and charged with four counts of aggravated murder and one count of use of a firearm in commission of a felony. Investigators said they believe the nanny and the husband conspired to lure Joseph to the home and falsely assign blame to him for Christine's stabbing. And then they went and shot Joseph so that he could not contradict the story that Juliana and Brendan were weaving. As investigators would randomly visit the home to give them updates and say they were checking in on evidence, of course, this was before the arrests, the investigators began to find photos of the nanny and the husband displayed in the home and the two were kind of like cuddled up next to each other okay there's you got the photos and then along with more evidence that has yet to be released detectives made their arrest and prosecutors made their indictments so here's the update to the case on tuesday juliana caved and she pled guilty to one count of manslaughter did she turn on her boyfriend you know the husband who's now her boyfriend Fairfax prosecutors have not confirmed if she has turned state's witness, but all indications are that Juliana will be testifying against Brendan and she most likely will not serve much jail time for that plea deal. And also with the plea deal, all knowledge of what Juliana has to offer in the form of testimony will now be locked up until the time of Brendan's trial. Okay, so we've got Brendan in jail. She's worked a plea deal. We're going to figure that out in a bit. But there was some stuff that was leaked prior to the plea deal. Here's what the two had shared before that plea deal happened. And these are the details that at least they say happened on that murderous day. We don't know if they're accurate or not. Okay, their shared stories follow this pattern. On that morning, Juliana said she left the Banfields home with the four-year-old daughter in tow. It seems that Christine had purchased tickets to the zoo and she had bought them online. Okay, I need to remind you guys, this is like 7.30 in the morning. That's early, but okay, I guess she's headed to the zoo with the child. She told investigators she forgot something back at the residence, so she doubled back to retrieve the sack lunches she had packed. When she pulled up to the home, Juliana said she saw the strange car in the driveway. She said she wasn't sure what was happening, so she called Christine before she went inside. But Christine did not answer her cell phone. Juliana said she then called Brendan's phone. She said Brendan was out at McDonald's grabbing breakfast, and when Juliana told him about the strange car in the driveway, he rushed home to check on Christine. Juliana said she and the four-year-old and Brendan, well, they all got together and they went in the home. Juliana claims that both her and Brendan found Joseph fully clothed in the bedroom with Christine naked and stabbed on the floor. Brendan then pulled out the gun he was carrying and he shot Joseph. Juliana said Brendan then gave her the code to the safe so that she could go grab a second gun. Now, in this initial story, the second gun was not fired. But later on, Juliana altered her story and said, Hey guys, I actually fired the second gun when I also shot Joseph in the chest. Okay, so during the first story, the two claimed they absolutely were not in a relationship. But that first story was also altered when Juliana's lawyers admitted they're actually romantically involved. Juliana and Brendan are seeing each other. Now, we've got months before we potentially will get the 100% real story. And who even knows if that's possible? Because if Brendan takes a plea deal, we may never find out all the details. But here's where it lays right now. Juliana will be sentenced in March of 2025. And Brendan's trial, well, it's set for February of next year. 
As the charges currently stand, if Brendan is found guilty, he could face up to life in prison. And in a fortuitous Instagram post from September of 2021, Christine Banfield talked about the special relationship between an au pair and the mother of the child. She called her daughter's previous au pair, the one before Juliana, quote, her best friend, her sister, her third parent, her everything. Now, Christine's obituary was filled with tributes to her dedication to her daughter and also to her profession. One person who commented said Christine was a fierce advocate of her patients. And they also said she had this just special ability to connect with the families of those she cared for. And Joseph's mother, well, she said her son was gentle and kind, that he was not an aggressive person and that he would never harm a woman, especially with a knife. She told the Huffington Post that there was no way her son woke up one day and decided to be a murderer. And as far as the now six-year-old little girl, the innocent child who didn't deserve to lose her parents to a lurid love affair that turned into murder, well, I truly hope she has people in her life who are loving her. And let's head to Canada next. I've held this story just hoping more details would emerge, but information is still scant. And I'm just so intrigued, I can't not tell you about it. And you might have heard rumblings about this tragic death of 19-year-old Gersimaran Kaur. Okay, back in the middle of October, Gersimaran died inside a Walmart walk-in oven. And she was discovered in the oven by her mother. Okay, here's what we know. Both Gersimaran and her mother were employees of a Walmart for at least about two years. Now, it was evening time, and Gersimaran's mother was starting to get a little worried. Her daughter was not in the store. Her mother had tried to locate her for about an hour, and she was getting deeply concerned. She had gone and asked other employees, but most of them said they were sure nothing was amiss. They just thought, maybe Gersimaran is out helping people in the store, and you just haven't run across her. Well, during that time, her mother tried the teen's cell phone, but the phone was not connecting. She knew in her heart, Gersimaran would not switch her phone off during the day. She's at near frantic levels now, and her mother reached out to the administration at the superstore, and that's when they started searching. Gersimaran was found in the walk-in oven about an hour later by her mother. Leaking fluid out of the door of the oven was reported to have been the reason they even looked in the oven. Right, but it's more complicated than that. We've heard about the 911 call now. That 911 call was placed after that fluid that was leaking out was discovered. And in that call, they said they believed Gersimaran was inside, but they couldn't get in the oven. But when the police arrived, the massive oven door was ajar and Gersimaran had been discovered. Now, police are being completely tight-lipped about the investigation, saying it's complex and that even a manner of death has yet to be confirmed. All right, I've seen TikTok videos that show it's impossible to lock yourself in the oven at a Walmart, like employees are showing that you can't lock yourself into this oven. Look, I've not worked a job like that, but I'd have to imagine that for insurance reasons, it would be near impossible to lock yourself in a walk-in oven just accidentally. All right, so working on that premise, what the heck happened to poor Gersimaran? It's truly a mystery at this point. A GoFundMe has started for the family who immigrated from India, and that GoFundMe has raised over $140,000, U.S. dollars, that is. But then the fundraiser was closed. Another mystery, and it's not being reported why, why it even was closed. Now, the funds were designated to be used in part for travel expenses to get Gersimaran's father and brother to Canada from India. Walmart did release a statement that focused on condolences for the family and the store associates. The statement also said that counseling is being provided for the store's staff. Well, the store has remained closed, at least until this recording, and staff is being paid for missed time at work. Gersimaran was described as a vibrant young woman who was excited about her new life in Canada. I'm for sure watching this one. 
I'll let you know more when I know more, and I'd love to hear your theories on this case. Hey, we've got a theme going here, stories with unanswered questions, and let's just keep it going because I've got a couple more. This time, we're in Monroe County, Tennessee. Almost two weeks ago, a man who identified himself as Brandon Andrade called 911, and he was telling a crazy tale. He told dispatchers that he had fallen off a cliff while he was running away from a bear. Okay, that's a new one. A plus for creativity. Now, when first responders arrived at the scene that had been described by the caller, they found a dead man who had the identification that belonged to Brandon Andrade. Remember, that's the guy who supposedly made the phone call. But guess what? The dead guy isn't Brandon. And after a little background digging, investigators learned that Brandon's ID had been stolen and used on multiple occasions before winding up on the body of a man who had either fallen or been pushed off of that cliff. And this murdered guy? Well, investigators have no idea who he is. One thing they have uncovered, though. 45-year-old Nicholas Wayne Hamlet of Alabama has been using that stolen identification belonging to Brandon. And good old Nicholas is wanted on a parole violation. Police have now issued a warrant for Nicholas's arrest. They believe he should be charged with first-degree murder for their murder victim that they've yet to identify that they found at the bottom of that cliff. The sheriff's office says Nicholas is armed and dangerous. They advise that anyone who sees Nicholas should just call 911 and let the authorities intervene. Authorities believe Nicholas will not return to his Tennessee home because he's got options. Nicholas has ties to Alabama, Montana, Tennessee, Alaska, Kentucky, and Florida. Nicholas has also been around the block. He has a history of using aliases, and he has also dabbled in crime. Back in 2012, he received a 20-year prison sentence after reportedly threatening a man at gunpoint, attempting to strike him with a baseball bat, and allegedly trying to bury him alive. Gosh, this this guy's creative. You got to give him that. During that incident that he received the 20-year prison sentence for, he used an alias named Joshua Jones. So yes, he goes by other names. Police are working to figure out who the murdered man is, and they're asking people to keep their eyes open for Nicholas. Monroe County deputies describe him as being about five feet, seven inches tall and weighing around 170 pounds. He has brown hair and blue eyes. Pictures provided of Nicholas show him with a full beard. Like he doesn't have a problem growing a beard, but you guys, we know that can change. So make sure you pay attention to the hair color and the eyes. Tips about Nicholas or the John Doe, our murdered guy at the bottom of the cliff, You can call in those tips at 423-442-3911. Now to two bizarre human remains cases, one out of California and one out of Illinois. One case has me asking so many questions and the other case, well, it's just simply amazing. So let's start with the first one. This is in Union City, California. Back on August 16th, police got a missing persons call for a 95-year-old woman named Nadine Parker. Nadine was known to suffer from Alzheimer's disease. I mean, she's 95. And authorities were just trying to find Nadine to keep her safe. Officers spent hours looking for her. And they stumbled across records that indicated she seemed to still own a home, which she had shared with her two sons. So you're probably thinking, why didn't they go to the house immediately? Well, Nadine had been reported to, for the last two years at least, been living at a senior center, so she's not connected to the home right now. They didn't really expect her to be there. But when they finally went to the home to search, and when they finally arrived, they were greeted with squalor, 10-foot-high piles of debris in the front and backyard, overgrown vegetation, a tremendous stench, and basically just an overall sense of disarray. When they entered the home, they found several people. They're not reporting how many, but they are saying that at first glance, these people seem to be experiencing maybe some varying degrees of mental health issues. As they searched room to room looking for Nadine, 
they got a surprise they weren't expecting. As they entered a bathroom, perched on the toilet was the mummified remains of a man. Police are the ones who use the word mummified. I didn't make that one up. So I believe in this instance, that just means the guy's been on that toilet for a very long time, months probably, and his body had dried up kind of in a state of natural decomposition. As those in the home were interviewed, police determined one of the men inside the home was Nadine's son. And if the mummified remains on that toilet weren't enough, Nadine's son, so the one who they figured out, well, he seems to have mold growing out of his ear. And Nadine's other son, well, they think he's the toilet guy. They're having to do some testing, but they think that's the mummified man on the toilet. Foul play does not seem to be involved here, but foul smell does. And poor little Nadine. Well, she was found safe and sound at a senior center. And now to Chicago. We have to jump back to 1978 when a man was renovating his home. As he removed a wall, he discovered a skull just stored there. Can you imagine the jump scare? Well, he immediately turned that skull over to authorities. But it's 1978. There's no DNA testing, really. All they could determine was that that skull was female and it belonged to a woman who died when she was probably in her early 20s. Okay, that's nothing really to go on. So this case went cold real quick. The case was so cold, the skull was turned over to a local museum. And there, it hung out in a storage room until employees rediscovered the skull in March of 2021 when they were deep cleaning that storage room. Museum employees turned the skull back over to authorities who, after some deep digging of their own, realized this was the skull from the home renovation project back in 1978, so 43 years previous. But 2021 is a different time, and forensic technology combined with genetic genealogy has created a massive database for identifying remains, also for catching criminals and linking cases together. In 2023, county officials contacted a Texas company that works on solving cold cases all across the country. Well, this company, called Othram, they basically used the skull to create a genetic profile for this Jane Doe. Once that family tree was established using DNA, authorities contacted a man named Wayne. This guy had submitted his DNA for testing at a genealogical site. And guess what? His DNA matched the DNA of the skull. So soundly was the match that authorities believed Wayne might be the great, great grandson of the woman whose skull they were identifying. Okay, linking it all together, they now had a name, Esther Granger, who apparently died in her teens. She was believed to only be 17 when she died in 1866. Authorities believe she died while delivering a child. Her body, they think it had been buried in Merrillville, but the skull was found 80 miles northwest in the walls of that home in 1978. When authorities contacted Wayne about his great-great-grandma Esther, he actually thought he was getting pranked. He told CNN that it took about three phone calls from authorities before he finally believed this discovery might be real. Here's why. Wayne's a retired police officer who lives in Portland, Oregon. So, of course, his senses are kind of heightened about possible scammers. He told CNN that the discovery via DNA genetic genealogy of Esther's skull identity, that he's now decided to take a job with the Multnomah County District Attorney's Office. He's going to be working on cold cases. What a great turnaround. But there's one thing we haven't answered yet. And I bet all of you are asking, how did Esther's skull end up in the walls of the renovated house? Well, there isn't an absolute answer, but there's a good guess. Authorities believe Esther was a victim of grave robbing. Officials believe her remains might have been dug up pretty quickly following her burial, and those remains were sold to a lab or to a scientist who would use the remains to study the human body. And since the discovery of the skull, 
the family chose to have her remains reburied in that original grave in West Botvia Cemetery in Illinois. All right, that's your Thursday episode of Rise and Crime. Thanks so much for joining me here on Rise and Crime. You guys are amazing. I say it all the time, best listeners. And I love it. You guys have been leaving me five-star reviews. If you haven't taken the opportunity yet, please do so on whatever platform you're listening on. And for those who did, a big thank you. I really appreciate it. It does help this podcast grow. You can also like and follow on all of our social media and YouTube accounts. We have three podcasts here at Oh No Media. Of course, Rise and Crime that you're listening to. Then there's Into the Dark with Peyton Moreland and Murder with My Husband with Peyton Moreland and Garrett Moreland. If you haven't figured it out by now, Peyton's my daughter. You can join me again on Monday for more morning crime news. I'm Mama Jules, and keep safe out there.